we're going to talk some about the, re the reset. And uh, we really have a, a special treat. Dr. Michael McFall, Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and Senior Director of Russian and Eurasian Affairs at the National Security Council. As most of you know, Mike uh, has most recently come to Washington from uh, Stanford University, where he was and is a professor of political science. Uh, he was also uh, the, uh, the director of the Center of Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law and deputy director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, as well as the Peter and Helen Bing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. I see why you might have wanted to come here, Mike, to Washington to have just one job instead of five. Um, <clears throat> and for many years, of course, uh, Mike was a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace, where Anders and I both had the uh, uh, privilege uh, and honor of working with Mike and uh, for many years there. Now, Mike was born and raised in Glasgow, Glasgow, Montana. <laughs> uh, and I, I, the coldest temperature ever in, Glas in recorded history in Glasgow, Montana is minus 59, minus 59. If you translate that into, that's centigrade. If you translate that into Fahrenheit, it translates in, into really cold. <laughs> It is a severe continental climate there. And perhaps this has had some influence in setting Mike in the direction of uh, his passion for Russia and Russian studies. Um, Mike uh, has been and is uh, the leading scholar uh, of Russia, of his, my, our generation. And uh, he has also now established himself uh, in the last two and a half years here with his tremendous work at the Obama administration on the National Security Council is really a leading uh, light in the policy making world. So Mike, um, we are delighted to welcome you here today. I think one of the signs of the success of this conference is the fact that Mike spent most of the morning here. Now, I don't think there are many slow days at the National Security Council. So maybe this is also a testament not only to the value of our conference but to his tremendous staff uh, and hold, hold things down. So Mike, thanks for uh, coming here today and telling us a little bit about uh, the larger context of U.S.-Russian relations. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thanks for that information about Montana that I didn't know. Um, and this is literally, since you mentioned it, I'll echo it, um, the first time in my entire time in government, I started the day after the inauguration, that I've ever spent this much time in Washington out of my office. Um, uh, uh, and that's a testimony, I hope, to how important we think the issues that you're talking about today are. Um, what I want to do in a, in a few minutes is to try to broaden the discussion. Uh, and it was a very nice segue from the last panel to what I want to talk about, which is I actually, I actually want to focus exactly on what the panel was focused on before. Uh, but I want to put it into a larger context of U.S.-Russian relations and where we uh, uh, at the White House uh, and the Obama administration see the, the issues that you've been talking about in the morning, both on the economic dimensions of our bilateral relationship in general and specifically on WTO and Jackson Van. Um, and let me begin by reminding you where U.S.-Russian relations were when we showed up for work that first day uh, after what was, to me, a fantastic day. Very, another very cold day, by the way, Andy. Uh, uh, inauguration day, when I hope some of you were with me. Uh, I shouldn't assume. Uh, maybe you're watching on TV. We were out there on the mall, and it was fantastic, and it was great. And I remember the first day of work at the National Security Council. Everybody would look at me and say, oh my god, you're the guy that has to deal with that problem. Right? Because uh, you got to remember where we were in terms of U.S. Russian relations in January of 2009. Uh, it was punctuated, of course, by the, the, the Russian Georgian uh, military conflict and the continuing occupation, I would say, uh, of Georgian territory. But well before that event, there had been what the president 
talked about in his first meeting with President Medvedev, a, a, a dangerous drift in U.S.-Russian relations that really goes on well beyond that, that point. And our job, as in the transition and then in the first uh, moments of trying to define a policy, was try to figure out what's to be done with that. Um, and uh, after the, uh, I think the Afghan policy review uh, was finished faster than we were, but then they, of course, redid their review, as, as some of you will recall, uh, 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 several months later. Uh, but ours was one of the top priorities, and it was a thorough review. It went through the process up to the principals and then to the president. And, and uh, since then, since the spring of 2009, we've basically been trying to execute this policy. So what I want to start with is just to tell you what the strategy is. Second, to pivot to, to the, the kind of win-loss uh, record that we have. And then third, uh, pivot from there to what is the next big agenda item, which is developing uh, the U.S. trade and investment um, uh, relationship, and particularly the WTO and Jackson family. So first, the strategy. Uh, the first idea, and uh, the president's idea, and you've seen him apply this kind of concept uh, to other bilateral relations as well, is that one, we need to engage, as opposed to disengage or sanction or coerce or, or, or invade, uh, you know, I guess there's lots of things you can do with countries. Uh, his first impulse is always to engage, whether it's with friend or foe, as a way to look for what he said many, many times in the bilateral relationship with Russia, to look for win-win outcomes. And so uh, rather than thinking in zero-sum terms, you know, two points for us, that means minus two for Russia, and we're happy about that. His worldview, uh, and most certainly is applied to the bilateral relationship with Russia, is let's look where our interests overlap and where we can do a deal that's good for Russia and good for the United States. And, and, and in an academic terms, which I know better than policy terms, that's a very classic divide. Uh, uh, intellectually and the, the theories of international relations, he's firmly in that liberal institutionalist camp as opposed to the realist camp that looks uh, you know, at the world in more zero-sum terms. Second principle of policy when we started was we have to expand the agenda of U.S.-Russian relations. I remember very vividly being in, in an early meeting at the White House where somebody, you know, because we were talking about the START Treaty, and, and somebody said, man, I feel like it's 1973 all over again. And the president weighed in and it's like, we cannot repeat that. We cannot just have a relationship with Russia that is just about arms control again. This is the 21st century. The Cold War is over. It has to be beyond that. So that was the second piece of, uh, of the, the, the policy, the, the strategy that we adopted. Third. We need, in order to achieve the, those first two agenda items, those first two objectives, we have to engage more widely and more often with all aspects of the Russian government. It can't just be left to Under Secretary Burns uh, or, you know, to McF well, not me, I don't do diplomacy, but uh, it can't be left to just some other people. Uh, we have to involve the president at the highest levels. Uh, and we have to involve you know, the whole of government. We have to have everybody involved in this campaign, not just one or two individuals. And so what we've done to do that, uh, the president has met, as you all know, many times with President Medvedev. Uh, I'm sure we're not counting, and we don't want to count because we don't want to offend others. Uh, but, but I know that it ranks, as, as in terms of bilateral meetings, one of the most frequent uh, relationships and frequent meetings that the president had with other leaders around the world. Um, but we also have other senior government officials that are involved. We just had Secretary Gates there, Admiral Mullins on his way, Secretary Clinton met with Lavrov this morning, uh, General Jones used to meet frequently with both his national security uh, advisor counterparts. Uh, national, my boss, Tom Donald, has been a little bit distracted with the Middle East over the last several weeks. But the, the notion is we got to get everybody in the, in the game. And part of that is what we created this, this presidential commission now with 18 working groups precisely to routinize contact with the Russian government so that it's not just this ad hoc thing. And even when we disagree, at least we're sitting across the table and we're disagreeing, looking at, at each other eye to eye, as the vice president just did with Vladimir Putin. A uh, very interesting conversation about Georgia, uh, where he stared at him and he said, I'm looking you right in the eye and I, here's what I'm going to tell you. Well, that's better than having them infer what our intentions are and what we're doing. <laughs> At least that's part of our, our strategy. Fourth, 
part of the strategy is a concept that we call dual track engagement. So as we are engaging in the government to government channel, which we have really, uh, I think, really accelerated and expanded and made more, uh, made more frequent uh, interactions, we are also engaging directly with Russian society. And by Russian society here, I want to say civil society, but also economic society or business as well, right? So part of our engagement is not just to go and meet your government counterpart, it's to go to engage with Russian society and Russian business as well. And every single trip you now see that started with the president, where the president spent day one meeting with the Russian government uh, when he was in Moscow in July 2009, he spent day two meeting with various aspects of society. And, and many of you are represented here today, which I'm very proud to see. We, we went to your school, Sergei. We did a bilateral uh, meeting with the business community. Uh, he, he attended a, uh, a parallel civil society event. And then he ended the day meeting with the, the, you know, the, the most critical people we could find of the Russian government. That was the criteria. Who are they? Who, who do they really not like us to meet with? You know who they are. Uh, some of them been in, in jail recently, in fact. Uh, uh, those were the people that he, he spent the, the, the last part of his day with uh, in Moscow. That's part of what we think. We think that's uh, part of the way that we are going to uh, uh, achieve our goals vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And then fifth part of the strategy is that we're not going to accept the, uh, I, we're not going to do it, nor are we going to accept the criticism that in order or, or the argument, I, I think I would say also, in thinking about some of my interlocutors in Moscow, or the argument that in order to have a better, I, I, that's even the wrong word, a more substantive relationship with the Russian government, we're going to have to downgrade uh, our bilateral relations with other countries in that region. We just fundamentally don't accept that. And we're not going to do that. Uh, and we've been criticized by people in the region around Russia and in Moscow for doing that uh, you know, from a different perspective. We're not going to do that. We think in the same spirit of win-win, we can have a reset relations with Moscow and, and also continue and expand relations with other countries in the region as well. So that's, in a nutshell, what we're trying to do. That's, the, that's what the reset means for President Obama and the Obama administration. What have we done? Uh, and what have we not done? And I, I want to go through this list quickly. I know most people here are interested in economics. But, but partly what I want you to know is that I'm going to give you 11 or 12 things. I'm, I'm skipping the little things because we don't have time. Um, uh, Anders told me not to use slides because he said it's going to be after lunch. If we turn down the lights, you might all fall asleep. Um, so I didn't, bring, I didn't bring my slides today. If you do fall asleep, however, I do have slides. Uh, and they'll be posted on the website. And then we'll get into the granularity that I'm not going to take the time in. Uh, 55 slides, I think, Andre. So a lot of detail there uh, that may, I probably would have put you to sleep. But it'll be there if you fall asleep. You can get into the details. So I'm just going to do the highlights, OK? One, Afghanistan. Uh, when we came in. Uh, almost all of our supplies to our troops and to our allies in Afghanistan went through Pakistan. Today that number, uh, as a result of what we're doing with Russia and other members of the Northern Distribution Network, is plus or minus 50% and it's accelerating. That's vital to our national interest, to something that's most important to us. This is not some, some thing we're doing to like create better mood, mood music in US-Russian relations. This is actually one of the most important things we're involved in. Uh, the execution of that war and stabilizing that country, Russia's been vital to that effort in terms of what they do in the Northern Distribution Network. And by the way, I would say parenthetically, not only is NDN expanded in all kinds of ways, but, but on military sales that came up today, actually we're, we are interested in Russian military sales these days. Uh, and it has to do with what we're doing in Afghanistan. Uh, and um, some other things we don't talk a lot about, but counter-narcotics uh, cooperation has expanded fantastically over the last two and a half years because we have common threats and common enemies that come out of Afghanistan. And we've realized that, and we're now cooperating on those things as well. <clears throat> Two, the New START Treaty. I hope you know what that is, uh, uh, an important treaty 
done at a, now that we can say that it's done, done at a faster pace than ever been done before with other treaties and ratified in a faster way than it has ever done before. Uh, so to those, you know, those, uh, never mind. I, I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, uh, and uh, I think just the last couple days, our inspectors went there for the first time. That's a good thing. That's a win-win for Russia and the United States. Three, Iran. For me, this is one of the most important achievements in U.S.-Russia relations over the last two and a half years. And maybe we had this cooperation before. I see other people from other, uh, other administrations. But I know, and, and maybe we did, and I don't want to judge the past. Uh, I can do that back at Stanford, or I'll let somebody else judge the past. But what I do know for a fact is that in January 2009, our ability to cooperate with Russia on Iran was extremely difficult because of other things that were going on in the relationship. And so what we have done over many iterations, beginning with the first meeting between our presidents in April of 2009 in London, was to make two kinds of arguments. One is to say that what is going on inside Iran is actually a threat to Russia. This is not just a problem for the United States and our <laughs> allies in the Middle East. This is actually a problem for Russia as well. And we've made some progress on that. We're, we don't have the same threat assessment, but we have, we're closer in that threat assessment than we were two and a half years ago. But the second argument that President Obama has tried to make to uh, President Medvedev is uh, to say, we understand you have an important geopolitical relationship with Iran and an important economic relationship with Iran. We, that, that, that was true when we came into government. Uh, what the president has tried to do, what President Obama has tried to do, is to say, look, I want to make our geopolitical relationship, U.S.-Russia relationship, more important to you than your bilateral relationship with Iran. And second, I want to make our economic relationship to you in the long run to be more important than your bilateral relationship with Iran. That's been our set of arguments. And, and I think we've seen uh, some real achievements, although there's a lot more work to be done on Iran in the future, unfortunately. Uh, but one on the cooperative side, uh, particularly on this, this, this offer that we made uh, on the, uh, the, the Tehran research reactor deal, where it was a really a Russian-American initiative vis-a-vis -vis Iran, we were offering new incentives to the Iranians uh, that had not been offered before in this context. They rejected them. And then we had tremendous cooperation with Iran, with Russia, no cooperation with Iran, uh, on UN Security Council Resolution 1929, the most far-reaching sanctions that there have ever been in place vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And in particular, there were sanctions on weapons that were not only symbolically important, but costly, uh, symbolically important vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the international community. I think in, in some ways, uh, you know, long term could be debilitating for uh, Iran's uh, capabilities. But they cost Russia real money, real money, not fictitious money. Uh, some estimates as high as $15 billion in trade was lost. So that's a real cost. That's not just, that's just not make-believe. And, and that was a big move in terms of what Iran did, what, what Russia did in terms of our cooperation on Iran. And then, quite dramatically, they canceled the S-300 contract, which, which literally the Russian government had to send money back to Tehran. They'd already been paid uh, some of the money for the, that, that particular uh, uh, system. They sent it back to Tehran. That, to me, is a real achievement in terms of US-Russian cooperation. Fourth, the one, two, three agreement. Uh, lots of people have tried to do it before. We got it done last year. Uh, fifth, Kyrgyzstan. Um, this one's interesting because one, one of the things that I inherited, one of the first crises I inherited as a government official, was when uh, the Russian government, uh, allegedly, I'm going to use some vague language because I see TV cameras <coughs> staring at me, so uh, basically put a lot of money on the table uh, for Mr. Bakiev, President Bakiev at the time. Some people say as much as $2 billion. And the price to be paid, allegedly, was to kick us out of what used to be called the Manas Air Base, uh, which is now the Manas Transit Center. Uh, that air base is uh, a vital security uh, interest of the United States because it's where the vast majority of our troops go in and out uh, to Afghanistan. 
And in our first meeting with President uh, Medvedev, uh, this was on the table. Uh, we were scrambling. Uh, we were trying to deal with this crisis. And the president kind of articulated the argument that I started with. He said, help me understand, President Medvedev, why you want us to leave Manas. Because what are our soldiers doing? They're flying into Afghanistan after you know, a, a, a short amount of time in Kyrgyzstan. And they're fighting people that if we weren't fighting them, you would have to be fighting them. That's more or less what he said. In other words, this is, a, this is not a zero sum game. We can talk about some you know, cockamamie 19, now that's my words, not the president's words. I want to be clear. Uh, he speaks much more uh, elegantly than I do. Uh, but the basic argument is that, you know, the 19th century having bases and somehow you control the country because you have bases. And by the way, we both had bases there and it didn't do us any good when Bakia fell, right? Uh, you know, the, the notion that we were controlling it because we had bases there. It was just a kind of different argument. It's like, let's leave the 19th century behind and think about the real threats here and what really matters to our interests. And, you know, we're still working on it. I don't want to say it's done, but I think it, we're in a very different place the way we talk about Kyrgyzstan in that region as a whole compared to where we were two and a half years ago. Six, the NATO-Russia reset. Uh, again, a lot of work to be done, but President Medvedev did come to that meeting in Lisbon, which I think was a historic <coughs> moment, uh, and a whole range of things on missile defense, Afghanistan, uh, that we're now trying to do together. That, as you know, that relationship had gone off the rails uh, 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 before we came in. Seven, missile defense cooperation. Uh, we're in the early stages of this. Uh, we have a fantastic amount of, of uh, energy and activity uh, underway right now at all kinds of levels to try to make this happen. Let me tell you frankly, we initially had to have a lot of fantastic activity within our own government uh, about this because let's be honest, the, you know, the notion for some people that fought the Cold War that we would then cooperate with Russia on missile defense is a pretty extraordinary thought. But we're doing this strictly because it's in our, it's in our security interest. We believe that more cooperation with Russia on missile defense, uh, in terms of sensors, in terms of data sharing in particular, will make us safer and will make our allies safer. And so we put together some rather bold ideas, and I don't, I don't want to prejudge them, but uh, we have a real dialogue going on this in a way that we did in a couple years ago. Eight, Russia's reset with several European countries. I'm thinking of Poland, Norway, Latvia, and maybe now even the UK. I'll let those countries speak for themselves uh, about why and what, what happened there. But I'll tell you, when they come to us, they, they say to us that the new atmosphere of US-Russian relations has made it safe for them to, to, uh, to tiptoe into their resets with, with Russia. And in particular, if you think of some of those countries I just mentioned, some of them have had very difficult, bad relationships with Russia for a long, long time. <laughs> Ninth, Libya, UN Security Council Resolution 1973. Of course, we know Russia did not vote for that. But there's no doubt that uh, the abstention was a dramatic change in Russia's uh, attitude, and I would say the Soviet Union's attitude, about the role of the UN Security Council in uh, condoning uh, the use of force in internal matters in other countries. Um, very unpopular in Russia, as other people here know. So uh, President Medvedev is, is, is exposed in his position in abstaining on that. We see that as a very positive thing, and, and we recognize it. Tenth, more generally, I don't I want to get to, to Jackson Vanek in a minute, but more generally on a whole host of regional conflicts. I think of North Korea, I think of our Ivory Coast, where, where Russia could have had a very different position and, and had a pullback position. I think of Sudan, where the president asked Russia to provide four helicopters in a crucial moment, and they just did. Uh, lots of cooperation in ways you know, that, that flow below the radar stream. Uh, and, and we, but we see it, and I want you to know that we see it. One big exception, of course, and that's Georgia. Uh, and this is the way I would describe our conversation, and, an ongoing conversation about Georgia with the Russian government. Uh, we believe that there's more security in that region of the world, and Georgia is more secure than they were two years ago. And we have been actively engaged with both Tbilisi and Moscow, not just one, 
but both places to try to do what we can to help make that region more secure. But it's still unstable. Uh, Russia still occupies uh, parts of Georgia. Uh, and we think there's a lot more that could be done to, to make that situation better. So, you know, I've listed a lot of achievements. This one, to me, as far as I'm concerned, is still in the failure column. There's lots more that we could be doing uh, that we haven't done there. Eleven, uh, Russian attitudes about the U.S. and vice versa. Uh, our positive of, our approval rating in Russia right now is, uh, well, it just it fell over Libya. Before Libya, <laughs> uh, and let's hope that's going to be short and, 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 and a blip on the, the Levada numbers, okay? Uh, but before Libya, we were up at 62%. Uh, that, uh, we, and, and depending on which numbers you look at, we were at 35, 38, and one number during the, the war, we were at 17% in terms of a positive attitudes towards America within Russians. That was in August 2008, I believe. Uh, this is the greatest jump percentage jump of any country in the world during the Obama administration. Now, there are other countries where it's higher, but we started, uh, we started at a lot higher pl place, right? So in other countries in Europe, for instance, it's higher, but we started January 21st, 2009. This is the highest jump in the entire world. Likewise, Russia was a top five threat for Americans in the fall of 2008. Now it's such a low, uh, you know, got other threats everywhere. It's so low that it doesn't even register in a lot of uh, opinion polls. That I think is a good thing. And then finally, on the on the list of achievements, I just I just remind you of all the things that aren't happening, the dogs that aren't barking, right? And and I know this these are counterfactuals, but 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 if I think about previous times in U.S.-Russian relations, you know, we don't have gas wars, we don't have cyber wars. And we don't have real wars. Now, all of those things can happen again, and we're fighting very hard to make sure they're not. But there's a lot of bad things that could be happening that aren't happening that I, I don't know if it's directly attributable to the reset, but, but i got to believe that we have something to do with it. Now, if you'll notice on that list, there's only one piece on my list that I would say is a real, true economic issue. That's the one, two, three agreement. And that's a good one. And Mr. Kiryenko was here and announced some billion dollar, multi-billion dollar deals. That's great. We, we were very proud of that. But what's missing uh, is, is the, 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 the multiple dimensions that the president articulated two and a half years ago for us to focus on. So without question, this year, as the president has said multiple times, ha the focus is on enhancing trade and, 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 and investment between our two countries. That is the number one achievement. And the reason why a member of the National Security Council, like think about my job. My job is not just what you guys are talking about. I got a lot, all those other things I just mentioned, that's part of my job. The reason I was here for six hours today is because this is the top priority in our entire bilateral relationship. I wanna make sure everybody heard me on that. If you fell asleep, I wanna make sure you heard me on that. That is our top priority in terms of US-Russian relations. Now, we believe in the free market, uh, and I want to make that clear too, that when we talk about trade and investment, the people that are going to make trade and investment grow, it's not the US government. By definition, if it was us, that would be wrong. Uh, we don't want to, we're not, the, we, and, and, and by the way, you, uh, the government officials are here. Every now and then, the Russian government comes to us and says, we need to have trade and investment, and that's why we need this US-Russian government project to do the X, or Y, or Z, right? You know, some multi-billion dollar investment project. And we say, you know, take it to Boeing, uh, to, to, to hint at one that some of you probably know about. We're not, that is not who we are. That's not what we want to do. Uh, we understand that it has to be the private sector first and foremost. We do see our job as to facilitate and to cheerlead. And I want to just spend a little bit of time on what we've done and then the agenda for the future. <clears throat> so first, high level meetings, this is always a top agenda. I mentioned the Parallel Business Summit in July 2009, the CEO summit we had here last summer. Thanks to, to those of you who are in the room that helped to do that. Uh, the, vice, uh, the vice president's trip just recently had a government to government com uh, component, of course, but also a business component. He went to Skolkova on purpose. I, I see some colleagues of mine who were there uh, uh, supporting the VC trips that have come out of the Silicon Valley. 
Medvedev's trip to the Silicon Valley. Uh, I, I'm from the Silicon Valley, by the way. I've lived there for 30 years. Uh, that, that wasn't a coincidence. That was part of our interaction about if you want to if you want to do Skolkova, don't go to Cambridge. Go to the real Silicon Valley. Sorry for those who, who wanted him to go to Cambridge. Uh, and it was good that he went there because he saw the real Silicon Valley. He saw Stanford too, by the way. And he met the governor, and the governor got excited about Russia, and the governor showed up in Moscow as well. We're not, we're not doing this, but we're facilitating these contacts. We're trying to make this stuff happen. Uh, second, we try in the margins, and, and very tedious things, through the business development and economic relations working group we have, to try to solve problems. Uh, and if you have more problems, bring them to us, those in the private sector. We want to do more in that, uh, that committee. They were just in Moscow uh, last week. They're working things. Uh, we want to do more on that, and that, that we do think is our job. And third, visas. Uh, the, vice, uh, the vice president and the prime minister joked about visa free travel. Actually, let me be more precise. The prime minister, Putin, joked about visa free travel with the United States when we met him two or three weeks ago. But the truth is, we hope to have a new visa agreement. It won't be visa free travel, but it'll be better than anything that's ever happened before. We take that as a serious thing. You've told us it's serious. The Russians, our Russian friends, think it's serious. We're, we're working on that. But without question, the number one biggest thing that we want to do this year in order to show a credible commitment to advancing trade and investment with Russia is getting Russia into the WTO and facilitating that process this year. Let me be clear. The President has said, the Vice President has said, Ambassador Kirk has said, every senior government official that has anything to do with this, uh, Larry Summers before he left the government has said, we support Russia's membership into the WTO, and we support it this year. And it's not just words, by the way. I want to be clear about this. Uh, we have taken a very active role in helping Russia in Geneva in, in, in our bilateral relationship. We had a very important meeting about a year and a half ago when Mr. Shuvalov came uh, with big delegation, and, and our side was chaired by Larry Summers uh, with all the proper people in the room. And with all due respect to the Russians in the room, uh, the, the talking points were, were kind of the old-fashioned ones. It's for some of you who are doing this before us. It's like, you, you know, this is a political decision. You've got to do this for us in the name of the reset, right? And we said, no way. We're not doing that. We're not doing you a favor by cutting some important, you know, some political deal uh, so that you can get into the WTO. And if, if, if somebody back in your government thinks that that's the way the WTO works, uh, they're wrong. But if they think that's the way the Obama administration works, they're really wrong. And it was a pretty, it was a pretty tense conversation. Uh, uh, and what we arrived at in this very interesting language, we're not going to do WTO minus, which was kind of the plea, right? You know, come on, get, get, let us get in on this. We don't really need to take care of this problem right now. Can't we do it later? Can't we do it 10 years after we join? You know, you did this for them and that, that kind of thing. We said, no, no, we're not. We don't want to have that conversation. So the WTO minus conversation, we didn't want to have a conversation. You just said, we're not doing that. And if you want to do that, we can negotiate for 18 more years. But we also said, and we made a commitment, which we, I think we've held, we're also not going to do WTO plus, which is to hold Russia to a higher standard to have to do what they, th they think were certain extraordinary things that were not required of other people, uh, uh, other countries joining the WTO. And so we, we, we hammered out a work plan that, that precisely defined what is right between a WTO plus and a WTO minus. It took lots of negotiations. Uh, and and you know, I, I only sit in at these meetings at the political level. The USTR colleagues, and Chris Wilson in particular, by the way, our negotiator, has done a fantastic job at taking from that meeting to where we are today uh, to make literally tremendous progress to get this done. But I want to be clear. Uh, the president's meeting with, Ob with Medvedev last summer, almost three quarters of the meeting was talking about WTO. Uh, and I'm not so sure, by the way, President Obama was so thrilled about that. Uh, but, but, you know, getting into some real details about what we need to do to make this uh, uh, the best deal that we can, we can have, not plus, not minus. Same with the, 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 the 
uh, Larry Summers' trip last fall, and same with the vice president's trip just a, just a few weeks ago, where the, the main focus of his trip was on economics, WTO, uh, and, and Jackson Vanneker. I'll get to that in a minute. And I know, because we're preparing for it right now, when the presidents meet in Deauville uh, at the end of, of May, again, this will be the number one issue, well before any of the other things I just mentioned. So we think we've made progress in terms of those negotiations and in particular what's happening out in Geneva. Let me just get, tell you why, and then end, I should end quicker, uh, with, with where, where I think is left to be done. So why do we care so much? And, and a lot of work's already been done in the morning, so I'm not going to repeat it. But first, the, we think the terms of Russian accession are solid. It's a good deal. Now, as was pointed out in the morning, we, haven't, we don't have the deal done yet. And so I can't talk about the tariff. I can't talk about a lot of things. I saw Chris Wilson last night to make sure I didn't say things. I don't know if Betsy's still here. Uh, and the, the truth of the matter is, it, the negotiation's not over, so we can't present it. We need to get to that point as soon as possible. And to my Russian friends in the room, I would, I would just uh, reiterate, until we get that done, the real negotiations here in terms of w, Jackson Vanek and PNTR can't happen. Because then it's all a kind of abstract conversation. Uh, but we think once it's done, we're very satisfied. We think we've got a really good deal that is, is, is good uh, you know, as a WTO package. Two, that follows from that, we believe, as, as others have said, that Russia's entry into the WTO will make Russian economy more transparent, more diverse, and more predictable. That's good for us. We also think it's good for the good, good, good folks in Russia as well. Again, we think it's a win-win. We think that's a good thing. That's in our national interest. Three, following from the first two, uh, we think there are real benefits to the American economy. And I can't improve upon what you all presented this morning already, Anders. All I would say to you guys, the two authors, uh, uh, one, please print this thing as soon as possible. Uh, two, have a one page or maybe two pages, but please not five pages, uh, that can be circulated to members of Congress uh, so that they, they take your regressions and your, your statistics and you, you make that story out there. Because if you heard in the audience, most people in the, in, on Capitol Hill, most people in the city don't under, do not know that story. They just don't. Ed knows this. They just don't know the story. There's a lot of like, you know, Russia circa 1985 conversations that I have. Uh, and don't get me wrong, there's lots of problems in the Russian economy too, and we're gonna, I'm going to get to those in a minute. But the, the basic facts where you can say, this is, this is the deal that has to come from us, and this is how the deal helps America. That is, a, that is an empirical conversation that needs to happen right now. I think it needs to start, and I applaud you guys for doing this, and, and I hope you will continue to do that uh, with members of Congress, because that story needs to be told. And by the way, it's way more credible for real businesses and real economists to be making that story than it is for you know, political hacks from the White House who, you know, we're, we're pinko communists that, that love the reset in Russia, uh, right? Uh, it, we, need that voice, we need that voice out there. It just cannot, it can't be us alone. Fourth, however, we're going we're gonna to take on two other arguments. Ed already mentioned that. Fourth, we're going to make the case that this is the time for Russia to join the WTO. And by that, why I mean also uh, termination of Jackson, Vanek, and PNTR. We can get into the, 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 you know, the sequencing we did in the last panel if you want about what would happen. We're not talking that way. We're deliberately not talking that way because we see these things happening together. We need this because we want to maintain the momentum in U.S.-Russian relations that I just described. It is. It's not a gift to Russia. That's a, that's a silly way to talk about it. We think it's in our national interest uh, for Russia to be in the WTO. Um, but we also want to keep the, pledging what President Obama said to President Mendieta before, that we want to make this bilateral relationship to you more important than your bilateral relationship with Iran. And for me, when I look out at the, 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 the things rolling down the pike that are not in the press today, but are really vital to our national security interests. How we manage Iran in the next, really, you know, six to 18, 12 to 18 to 24 months, 
this is, this is a vital, big security issue that we're, you're reading about other things for good reason, but when I think about that region, and I know I speak for the entire administration when I say this, this is a giant national security threat and a national security problem that we're dealing with and we're going to have to deal with in the timelines I talked about. We need to be cooperating with Russia on that issue, not to be on the other side of the barricade. Fifth, we, some people mention the democracy and human rights thing. We do not believe that withholding a vote on Jackson Vanek actually helps the cause of democracy and human rights in Russia. That linkage that may have worked in 1974 and as an academic and as a kid, by the way, as a, in college, I wrote about Jackson Vanek, who was a fantastic piece of legislation that did a lot of great things uh, in terms of Jewish immigration. But it doesn't serve the cause of democracy and human rights in the 21st century today. That's, that's our argument. Uh, it doesn't create leverage with us. Somebody mentioned it. I, I, I don't even understand that argument anymore. What leverage does it create uh, in, in, in uh, what we're doing, either in Geneva or in conversations about these things? Uh, I would add that increasingly, Russian Democrats themselves are the voices you should be listening to. So when the vice president met with leaders of the Democratic opposition uh, in Russia uh, just a few weeks ago, we had this conversation, and several of them, uh, privately and others publicly, Boris Nemtsov, for instance, went out and said, we don't support holding Jackson Vanek again anymore. That's not in our interest. They see it in their interest for Russia to be in the WTO and to take this, this issue that is easily politicized by their opponents, by the way, uh, to take it off the issue and to talk about other things. What they talk about, which I think is a creative idea, is let's have a I have another act, you know, call it the Jackson Vanek Act of 2011, and do things there that could be useful to the purposes of advancing democracy and protecting human rights in Russia. We are all for that. We are all for that. When it comes to visa bans, when it comes to more support, when it comes to any, you know, we want to have a, a, a dialogue about it, we're not going to have an argument with Congress about that. We actually agree with Senator McCain and others that are worried about these things. We just think that this mechanism that they're using is not having the effect that they desire. And so that's going to be our approach to the, the, those set of issues on this debate. Um, finally, on prospects, I, I would just say this. We, I, I, Dorothy was very wise not to predict when these things happen. If you've been doing it for 18 years, as some people have, you know, predicting when Russia is going to get into the WTO is very dangerous. So I'm not going to do that. I am going to say that we have never been closer, that we have a full government effort to do the things that we can do, uh, including you know, facilitating what's happening in Geneva, working very closely with our, our, our partners there, Mr. Medvedkov. Uh, and we fully expect that the, uh, the, the deadlines that the Russian government have set are things that we think are reasonable. And I, and I just want to leave it at that. Um, but this is something we want to get done this year. What's left? Georgia hasn't been mentioned. Let's just mention it. Georgia's not done. There's not Russia. Georgia's a member of the working group. Uh, the working group report will not go forward without consensus. Uh, that is an issue that has to be dealt with. We have some ideas. We facilitated the contacts between uh, the Russian government and the Georgian government. President Obama himself was personally involved in setting that up. Uh, it's a good thing they're talking, but it's got to get done. Uh, and to those of you in the technicalities, I've heard some Russian government officials say, well, maybe we've got to figure out a different way to resolve this. Uh, and they talk about votes. Ecuador comes up, uh, Israel before the WTO. Let me just be clear. That is not our view. We're not looking for a, a compromise that doesn't deal with the actual issues in terms of U.S., uh, in terms of Russian-Georgian trade relations. We want there to be a resolution. We also say to the Georgian government, this is not a mechanism for you to resolve uh, your political issues with Russia. We've been categorically clear to them on that. But we also have been categorically clear to uh, the Russian government that don't expect us to, to uh, squeeze the Georgians in the name of getting this done. It's got to be real. It's got to be a negotiation. And by the way, there, the consensus has to be at the working group level. Yes, there can be votes in the council, although it never happens, maybe once. 
uh, but you don't get there until you get consensus out of the working group. Uh, second, there's some technical things. I think I'll, I'll not go into that. I, I would just say one, that, and others have already mentioned it, I just say one thing that we are going to have to show uh, more on in terms of our arguments on Jackson Bannock. I think the, what's happened on IPR is very good, very solid. Uh, it, there is a perception, I, I'm just going to leave it as perception and not judge it, but there is a perception, it, I, don't, I don't see if Stanislav is still here, uh, he said it's bullshit. Well, um, well, you got to help us then to prove that it's bullshit. Uh, because that, so we got to have more, we got to have more data and we got to have some, you know, some evidence of enforcement. Uh, and I, even if it's not obligated under the WTO, that will just help the debate here. And there are, there are a bunch of things like that on the, on the, the phytosanitary stuff as well. But I think it's all manageable. I don't think any of that is anything that will stop the progress of getting this done this year. Um, and then I'll just say in conclusion on our side, we understand that the, the, the priority of, uh, of a serious debate and a vote on Jackson Vanek this year. We know it internally, we're deliberating on it uh, uh, often. You need to understand that we also have a lot of legislative business up there. Uh, just yesterday, we finally got a, 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 a deal on something that's very important to the American people. It's called the budget. Uh, done. Um, and, you know, we, we only have so many people that work on legislative affairs. We also have three free trade agreements that we are working very hard on. Although I think we're making good progress on that, by the way. And those, we believe, if we get those done in a bipartisan fashion, which we're trying to do, we think will create the permissive conditions to have the right kind of debate on Jackson Van. That's our strategy uh, in terms of that debate. We understand the debate, as Ed said very rightly, is going to be a debate about Russia generally. Uh, it's going to be about the economics. It's going to be about the geopolitics and the democracy and human rights. We have a set of arguments on all three of those, and, and we, we look forward to that debate. Um, and we think that this can be done this year, provided that Russia gets its deal done this year. And I would just conclude on one thing. 18 years, it's time to wrap this up. That's enough. Uh, it would be a good achievement for Russia. We think it'd be a good achievement for the American economy. And we think it'd be a good achievement for the reset in a way that would not have to divert our attention from important issues of democracy and human rights in Russia. And with that, I'll conclude. And maybe if I haven't exhausted our time, take one or two questions, Andy. <laughs> Mike, that was a tour de force. Uh, if is it possible that we could hold you here for about uh, ten more minutes? Yes, I, I, I know I went over time. So. Okay, so there are a lot of lot of questions there. I'd like to put put one on one on the table, then we'll take several from the floor, and you can respond. And we'll see how much we have we have time for. Mike, um, uh, do you see any risk to the U.S. Russia relationship uh, if we are not able to come through on WTO uh, this year? And is that is that would that be a, a piece of the argument that would be that would be put forward? Are there other things at, at risk in the broader relationship if if we're not able to do this and but we put so much uh, emphasis and put in so much time and work and effort into it? Okay, I see, Sergey. I, I have two simple questions. Uh, one thing you mentioned is momentum. Momentum is important. You've done start. You work on one to three. You did that, then missile defense, then Libya, then then WTO. What happens afterwards? So, assuming the WTO happens soon, hmm. uh, uh, what is I can next? Go back visa, to visa, visa, exactly. <laughs> visa free regime. Well, well, at least I don't know. Long term visas, ten year visas, whatever. What is what is the momentum? What are the next things? And the other question is. Uh, given that uh, much of cooperation is based on uh, on personal relationship between uh, the two presidents, what happens if uh, President Obama is in office in a year from now, but President Medvedev is not? Well, how this relationship is going to develop? Or vice versa. <laughs> David. Thanks for a great presentation. Uh, hard to imagine how anybody would fall asleep during that. Um, I'd like to uh, follow up on your analysis of Georgia, which I thought was, uh, you outlined, I think, a brilliant strategy uh, for the U.S. in mediating. Uh, as, but I'd like to elaborate it a bit because, uh, as you know, there, there are two key issues. Uh, one is uh, 
the embargo that Russia imposes on Georgian exports, which uh, is a clear trade issue. <coughs> and then the other is this checkpoint, which uh, you've alluded to is a more of a political, uh, we might characterize it rather than a trade issue. And so uh, in, in, in mediating this dispute, uh, it would seem to me that Russia is going to have to uh, eliminate the embargo, and that would then, in, I mean, you mentioned that you're not going to put pressure on Georgia, but if, if all the issues are off the table, including the Russian embargo, and are only left with this political issue, which you mentioned you don't think should be uh, the basis for uh, Georgian objection to Russian accession, would you at that point be willing then to go to Georgia and, uh, and, and ask them to uh, allow Russia to accede, and at the same time explain prior to that to the Russian, the Russian side the necessity of taking the trade issue off the agenda by removing the embargo? Thank you, Andrei Sito from TASS, the Russian news agency. Uh, basically, a clarification. Did I understand you correctly that your strategy, as you described it, the strategy is first three FTA and then WTO for Russia, in, uh, as, a, as a like on the crest of the wave. Uh, secondly, if you could, you, you said that uh, President Obama was personally involved uh, with working uh, on the Russia-Georgian dispute, if you could elaborate on that. And, and thirdly, I'm uh, very personally interested in your visa uh, news uh, that you gave us. Uh, can, can you can can you yeah can, can, can you tell us a little bit more about what uh, what you have in mind, uh, and uh, especially since if you are interested about the public perceptions in both countries, journalists are important, and the visa regime for journalists for both sides is terrible. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, Mike, a set of uh, quite simple uh, questions, which you can knock out very quickly, then we can move on to the next round. Yeah, Andre, I, I forgot your second question. I'm sorry, I wasn't right. The second one, Obama. Uh, oh, Obama no, George. personal, you're right. Okay, uh, big questions. On the risk, I, I want to start now to separate out WTO from Jackson Vanek, because they sometimes get conflated and they're very related, but in terms of the momentum, we've been very clear in the way we talk about WTO is that that's what we're talking about with the Russians, right? Um, uh, I would say parenthetically to, to echo something Andre said, uh, a Russian effort uh, to explain, to, to, to engage on Jackson Vanek, not, not Jackson Vanek, but on WTO, why it's in the interest, and it, it is missing, it is true. And, and our colleagues on, on the Hill say this, and when they compare it with other, with, with the free trade, the other agreements, there's a bigger dialogue about, you know, the South Koreans and, and the China, you know, we did mention the PNTR with China. It's just different. And I, you know, I, I just echo what Andre said and, and as food for thought. But, but I want to separate those out because when we talk about it in the bilateral, we'll talk about WTA. I, I, I would just put it this way. We, we, we have a, a bilateral relationship that, uh, is delivering things that, that I, and I really want to emphasize this, because we had this debate. It's not, it's not, we're not developing a good relationship or a happy one or where we can feel all good about it. We're actually like doing real stuff. And the idea is that if you do that, that creates the mood music, not the other way around. That's been the president's view from the beginning. So by the way, Jackson Vanek, somebody said in the early part of the transition, you know, a way to make the Russians really feel good is if we could lift Jackson Vanek. And that would help us to get the START Treaty in Iran. And you know that would be, a, it doesn't really matter, right? Because it doesn't really matter. But symbolically, it would be really good for the mood music. Uh, and we, we said, no, we want to do it this other way. And if you think about the way the president thinks about foreign policy generally, that, he's very much in that, that way of thinking about things. So for us, this is the next big win-win outcome. And so to not get it done would mean that less momentum most certainly would mean less momentum. It doesn't mean the end of the world. We, we have other, lots of other things, I'll get to your question in a minute, Sergey, that we have to work on, and we're gonna work on them in parallel. We're not gonna stop working on, say, Iran or missile defense because we failed on WTO. We, we've very, been very clear with Russia. We reject their linkage. And, and by the way, they, they, in the early phases of our time in government, there was a lot of kind of linkage, you know. Well, if, if we'll, we'll do this on, on, on this country if you do this on this country. And we said, no, 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 we're not going to do that this way. We're going to try to keep these things in their own lane. So we would do that if we had to. But let's be clear, it would not be good for the momentum because we've made, you know, we've made such a big deal out of it to have failed. That, that means, you know, 
that, that, that we're not achieving things we set out to do. Next steps, I, I really can't even think about that because uh, uh, the, the steps in front of me seem so big and daunting. But what I would say about that is uh, missile defense is not something we're going to do this year. That's going to be over several years. And, and we do believe that if it's done the right way, in a way that makes Russia more secure, and makes us more secure, and makes our allies more secure, and we think there's ways to do that, that's a game changer. That really fundamentally changes these old debates about European security and you know, NATO versus Russia and you know, just all this kind of tired baggage from, from yesteryear. This, is, I think, gives us a real opportunity to move beyond that and talk about concrete threats and concrete ways we can cooperate uh, to fight those threats. Uh, but I would also say, in terms of our agenda, uh, there is a, a range of security issues. And, and Iran and North Korea come to mind right away, where cooperation with Russia is vital to solving those in the right way. And that, those things have not gone away. Just because you're not reading about them does not mean that those issues have been solved. And, and, and particularly Russia's role vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran is going to be vital to us uh, in, in the next coming years. And then I would say something I've on, which I skipped because I went on too long, but I'll say it now. You know, we believe uh, that it's in our national interest to uh, advance and promote democratic institutions uh, abroad, including in Russia. And we have a whole argument, the President's outlined a whole set of arguments in a set of speeches that he's given about why we think that to be true. And, and, and we have articulated a strategy, a new strategy, for how to do that vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, and I'm happy to send you, uh, actually, it'll be in the slides, Andre. So I, I, I go to the website and get it uh, later the, uh, this afternoon. But, you know, uh, trying to do peer to peer dialogue so that we engage Russian civil society with American civil society, trying to modernize Russian civil society. President Medvedev talks about modernization, and we agree, but we want to do it in, in many dimensions including civil society so that they, you know, they use basic things like Facebook and Twitter and social media uh, things instead of, you know, doing kind of handouts uh, at the metro. Um, uh, and there are a variety, you know, uh, transparency, open government initiatives, which President Medvedev has, has leaned into. We have a big open government initiative in the Obama administration, so we see this as a, as a, a place for cooperation. That empowers civil society. Uh, but the results of all those new initiatives have been minor. Uh, I want to be clear about that. I don't see, and, and so that means that we have a long-term agenda that we have to continue to be engaged in on those things. On Georgia, uh, um, on the two issues, the embargo and the, the customs union, um, I don't want to say too much because there is a negotiation going on, there is a mediator, and I'm not that, I'm not the mediator. Uh, and we are not the mediator, very deliberately. We, we are not the mediator in this, though we're very, very you know, we're in keenly engaged and keenly aware of what's going on. Um, I, I guess I would say the way I see it going right now is I don't think the embargo issues at the, at the end of the day will be, uh, I think those will be resolved. I, I'm not worried about that. Uh, but there is this fundamental issue about the border. And for those of you who don't know the details, can I just, Take a few minutes to, because I think it's, it, one needs to understand this precisely. Uh, there are borders that Russia and Georgia uh, dispute, obviously, right? So let's just focus on the Abkhaz Russian border. Uh, the Georgians think that that's their border, uh, and Moscow thinks that that's a border between them and the independent state of Abkhazia. So you, it's a dispute. By the way, the, most of the world is on our side. And we recognize that border as being a Georgian border, not an Abkhaz border. And, and I want to emphasize that clearly, that, that Russia here is, 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 is out of step with the rest of the world, including the rest of most of the members of the WTO. Let's be clear about that. The, the same folks that have recognized that border as being Georgia's are also members of the WTO. Um, what we have said to both sides is you're not going to resolve that issue of sovereignty in the WTO negotiations. And if that's what you're trying to do, on both sides, by the way, they both want to use it to, to, to de facto uh, to, to say this is our border. Uh, and we're saying that that's a bad strategy. We, we can't support either side from politicizing what, what you rightly said should be about WTO stuff. 
At the same time, we can't ignore this very peculiar situation where, from the Georgian point of view, goods travel into what they believe to be their sovereign territory, and they don't know what they are. They, that's, that, you know, whether it's a legitimate WTO issue or not, it's an issue about their economy. And, and if, they had, if they put trade officials on the Abkhaz-Georgian border, it wouldn't be a problem. But there's no way in hell they're going to do that, because that de facto then creates facts on the ground about where the borders really are. So they have this stuff coming in, and then it goes into wherever in Georgia, and they don't know what it is. We think there's a creative solution to that without having to put customs officials, you know, without having to resolve the border in a de jure way. We think there are ways, and I'll just leave it at this, to increase transparency and information flows about what might be going across that border that could, without figuring out you know, who's in charge of the border and the de facto versus de jure, would create the information that would, would be good for everybody. And by the way, the Russian government says they're for transparency. They, they want to increase transparency. Well, that's a border that we could use a lot more transparency about, even if, if they, it was recognized the way they want. So that's, that's, the, that, to me, is, is a, a, a possible way to think about it and to frame the problem. Uh, and I, I want to stop because the negotiations are ongoing. Until the deal is done, it's, we can't sell a deal to the Congress that's not done. We can't. They don't, want to, they don't want to talk to us about it. Well, we, it might be this, it might be that. We don't know yet. The negotiations are still going on. They say to us, you know, come back to us when, when you know the facts, when you have the deal, and that we can talk about it. Now, it's got to be, you know, there's, informally, there's way more of that going on, and we brief them every week uh, at the staff level. But until it's done, we can't actually really have that debate because they say to us, you're asking us to vote on something. That's, that's the one place, if I can be clear, Ed, that's the one place where they say, we will not vote for Jackson Vanek until we know what the WTO deal is done. That's, that's the one place where I think it's legitimate. That's their leverage to, to, to you know, I, don't, I think they overestimate it, but that's the one place where I think there's something to it, that we've got to be able to present them something before we ask them to vote on Jackson Vanek. Other countries have done it differently. They've had that vote earlier. And other countries, Moldova is being one, uh, join the WTO and still uh, Jackson Vanek still obtains to Moldova. So it can be done in a range of ways. Our strategy is to time those things to be as close as possible. Because that, we believe, is the way to, to not string out a political debate on the Hill about Jackson Vanek. We want it to be as close to, to the deal that is there. And we also think that because it'll be imminent, that it'll, it'll focus the attention of US businesses and, and we'll, we'll kind of have you know, a, a time where everybody will be focused on it at precisely the right time. If we start the debate now and we talk about Jewish immigration, I, I believe me, I know I've heard Mr. Putin and Mr. Medvedev tell me all, all the reasons why this, you know, this is not fair and all that. But let me tell you, there's a lot of things that are not fair and are not logical that happens in terms of executive legislative relations in this country. Uh, that's not an interesting argument to roll up there right now. So we want to roll up that argument. We want to engage that argument when we have the deal at hand because we think it's going to be a really good deal. On Obama, I, I would just say, I, I, I shouldn't have said that. I would just say they, uh, like all issues, major issues in US-Russian relations, whether it's the START agreement or sanctions against Iran uh, or this agreement, these two particular uh, leaders, for whatever reason, uh, uh, get into the details and actually do a lot of negotiating. Uh, and that's a great asset we both have, I would say. And that gets me to the final uh, question about, uh, well, I'll, get to, I'll end on visas. Um, uh, the, the thing about Putin versus Medvedev, uh, that's great. You guys can speculate over coffee and all that. We're not interested in that. We're not going to play that game. There's one president. We deal, why, why does President Medvedev deal with, with Medvedev? Pre, why does President Obama deal with Medvedev? Is because he's President Medvedev, not Prime Minister Medvedev. And that's, that's the way it is. Uh, uh, that means that when we go to Deauville, just to be very practical about it, or we go to APEC, or we go to these multilateral meetings, we go to UNGA, it's President Medvedev that is there. Prime Minister Putin is not. And, and that's, that's, the, that's where a lot of business gets done. 
Having said that, I would just point out the obvious fact that when Vice President Biden was in Russia, he met with President Medvedev the first day and he met with Prime Minister Putin the second day. And we will continue to do that because that's the way we're going to advance our interests vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And we'll let those guys and you, voter, citizen uh, of Russia, decide. Uh, I hope, uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to decide uh, who will be the next president of Russia. Finally, on visas. Let me just say this. We're negotiating, Andre. We're working hard. And stay tuned. Maybe we'll have something to announce uh, um, the next time our presidents get together. OK? Mike, I got news for you. I just got a text from President Obama. He does want to see you in the office. Okay. <laughs> so we got to wrap this right. up. Thank you very much.